Good morning, everyone. And welcome uh, to the first annual lecture in Reformation Theology here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Thrilled to see so many people here uh, to listen to a lecture on the Reformation. Uh, this event is co-sponsored by the Departments of Church History and Systematic Theology here at TEDS. And really the idea for this annual lectureship was hatched on a car ride to the 16th Century Conference uh, a couple years ago. Dr. Manich and I were driving along with uh, Dr. Marty Clower and we were sort of lamenting the fact that um, across the academy, there seems to be a declining interest in the Reformation. And um, we here at Trinity, as a Protestant evangelical community, we celebrate and are very much grateful for our Reformation heritage. And so we thought it would be fitting uh, to institute an annual lectureship. And we're grateful for your support from the Dean's Office to make that happen. And I can't think of a better inaugural speaker than our guest today, who I'll um, allow Dr. Manich to introduce more formally in just a moment. I do want to um, let you know that there will be a time of question and answer following the lecture, and that includes those of you who are joining us through the live stream. So please do submit your questions. We've got a nice full house, so hopefully we'll enjoy a wonderful discussion. So with that, I'm going to hand over the microphone to my colleague, Dr. Manich, from the Church History Department to introduce our speaker. Well, it's our special privilege this morning to welcome to campus Dr. Richard Muller, Professor Emeritus of Calvin Theological Seminary. Uh, Dr. Muller earned his BA in history from Queens College City University of New York in 1969, his MDiv from Union Theological Seminary, and his PhD in Reformation Studies from Duke University in 1976. He worked with uh, a well-known historian there uh, named Dr. Steinmetz. Uh, who, in so many ways, he and his students have broken fresh ground in the history of exegesis over the last 30 years. Uh, Dr. Muller taught at Fuller Theological Seminary for 12 years before moving over to Calvin Theological Seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where he was the P.J. Zondervan Professor of Historical Theology from 1992 to 2015. Dr. Muller's research and writing has focused largely on the reassessment of the development of Protestant thought after the Reformation, although he's moved in many different directions and engaged many different debates over the years. In particular, he is one of the historians credited with challenging the Calvin against Calvinist theory of developing Reformed thought. And in this light, his numerous books, including The Unaccommodated Calvin, 2000, after Calvin, 2003, his massive post-Reformation reform dogmatics, and more recently, his Calvin and the Reformed Tradition, 2012, continued to be essential reading for scholars and students interested in the development of the Reformed Tradition in late 16th and, 17th, and the 17th centuries. Dr. Muller, we thank you for your distinguished career and all the ways you've served us over the years through your writing and through your lecturing and welcome once again to Trinity. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, some of you may know that I was, I was here, I guess, 11 years ago, and I, I delivered a, a, a paper on Jonathan Edwards that ended up being much more controversial than I had expected. Um, <laughs> I'm not planning on being controversial today. I'm just going to say nice things about Calvin. <laughs> But it is a pleasure to be here. Um, I've always felt a, a, a compatibility with, with the, the goals, the theology, and the faculty here at Trinity. And, and I should add, given if, if you think about doctoral family genealogies, um, Professor Manich is my uncle, and <laughs> Professor Louie is my nephew. <laughs> uh, so, so there we go. Um, Cal Calvin on. Whoa. On, on tradition. I, I, I called it traditio and paradosis versus humanas traditiones. Um, the state of the question of Calvin on tradition is, 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 is ra rather significant, um, particularly given the fact that um, scripture and tradition has become, again, a fairly significant debate point in Reformation studies, um, particularly given Brad Gregory's claims concerning the role of the Reformation in the destruction of almost everything that is good and wonderful in the world. Um, 
Gregory draws on the approach of earlier genealogical histories by claiming a point in the past as a source of perceived modern problems and then writing a highly selective narrative in support of the claim. Um, to identify the origins of Reformation protest as he does, um, in some aspect of a purportedly decadent late medieval theology, it's to say the least old hat. It's a new version of an old failed argument. Um, with particular reference to the issue of tradition, despite the seeming density of his citations, Gregory's approach amounts to an exercise in cherry picking rooted in the highly biased accounts of the Reformation found in earlier works of Roman Catholic writers and on a wooden, rather restricted reading of Sola Scriptura. Um, one of the questions then is, how do we get at this problem? Um, and and the, the fact is there are other approaches and other studies, one of which goes back to that academic genealogy. If you think about Heiko Obermann and his analysis of the problem of scripture and tradition and his identification of tradition one as a view of tradition, not as a second source of religious and theological truth, but as he called it, the history of obedient interpretation, as distinct from tradition two, where you have tradition and scripture as separate sources. Despite the importance of that issue, I find comparatively little done on Calvin's thought on tradition, um, whether in relation to his understanding of traditions in general, or with a view to the relationship between his thought and what Obermann came up with concerning tradition. There's an older study in French by Revaillot that recognized that Calvin's negatives were largely reserved to human traditions, and he elaborated at length on Calvin's use of the fathers, and he concluded by noting the abyss separating Calvin from the Roman Catholic claim that the rule of faith is constituted by scripture and tradition as interpreted by the church's magisterium. More recently, another author has argued that Calvin offered no extended treatment of the notion of tradition, only to add the problematic conclusion that Calvin tended to reject the category of tradition in its entirety, largely for polemical reasons. Calvin's critical and frequently negative stance registered um, by quite a few writers, um, assuming that Calvin's stance was typically negative, although countered to a certain extent by looking to Calvin's consistent use of the church fathers. Um, one author concludes that whatever Calvin said about tradition, his own use of tradition at times accepted its normative power, without however examining what Calvin actually meant when he referenced tradition. Um, several essays, notably Berlin Catholics, have simply identified Calvin's view of tradition as utterly negative typically with reference to his term, humanas traditiones, human traditions, as if that summarized all of Calvin's thought. An alternative bias scholarship has looked at his positive reception of traditionary materials. Um, his views on the relative support um, given to the reform by referencing early church fathers and councils, um, notably his reply to Sadoletto has been examined. Other studies have looked at his use of the church fathers in depth, and still others have looked at some of his use of patristic exegesis. With the partial exception of the Reveo study, however, none of these essays has examined in detail what Calvin says about the terms traditio and traditiones, not to mention his extensive exegesis of terms paradosis and paradidomy in the New Testament. Accordingly, much of the excellent scholarship fails to identify the fairly clear and biblically grounded distinction made by Calvin and other reformers between the legitimate paradosis and what they identified as human traditions. So in what follows, I, I want to fill, fill up that gap. Uh, first, some comment on scripture and tradition in Calvin's earliest works, 1536 to 1539. Calvin's concerns over the problem of the claim of normative traditions in the church spans the entire course of his career from his earliest publications to the final edition of the Institutes. His earliest references to the problem of traditions are found in the 1536 Institutes and perhaps more elaborately in the 1538 Catechism. In the former document, he rails specifically against ecclesiastical rules concerning contracting marriage, abstaining from food, and against regulations imposed by councils. These are traditions, he says, that cannot be traced back to the apostles. 
the rulings of the apostles did not impose burdens on conscience and didn't contaminate worship with human inventions. The 1538 Catechism is even clearer on the issue. And quote, civil observances by order and decorum are kept in the assembly of Christians. These are by no means to be classed among human traditions, but are rather to be referred to that rule of the apostles provided they are not believed to be necessary to salvation or to bind consciences by religion or are regulated to the worship of God or lodge piety in these things. But we stoutly resist those regulations which under the title of spiritual laws are enforced to bind consciences as if necessary for the worship of God. The reference in both cases is quite specific. Calvin did not here attack either tradition in general or all particular traditions belonging to categories of teachings and practices. Nor did he attack either the ongoing churchly exposition of scripture or teaching found in sound theological treatises concerning doctrines of faith. As stated explicitly in the 1537 articles concerning the organization of the church, Calvin held that there was a place for church ordinances that would assure the genuine preaching of the word and the right administration of the sacraments without binding the conscience as necessary to salvation. These were not the target of his polemic against human traditions. On the other hand, Calvin insisted that subscription to the confession catechism of the Genevan church should be required on the assumption that conscience may be bound when there is a conjunction of confession of faith with scripture. Such a confession must not be stitched together superstitiously, he says, but composed of words that have their meaning constrained by the truth of scripture and that as much as possible are free from the harshness that might offend godly ears or attach something to God that is unworthy of his majesty. As John Thompson points out, Calvin's attack on superstition evidences two directions against the excessive use of biblical terms without proper explanation and against the use of non-biblical terms that did not relate directly to the sense of the text. A public confession or catechism should be, in Calvin's words, a Catholic testimony. He says, catholica testificatio, to the faith of the church. Calvin's positive understanding of traditions is quite clearly stated in the reply to Sadoletto penned in 1539, barely a year after the publication of the Latin Catechism. Sadoletto appealed to Genevans to return to the common faith of the church inasmuch as the church has regenerated us to God in Christ, has nourished and confirmed us, instructed us what to think, what to believe, wherein to place our hope, and has also taught us by what way we must tend toward heaven. He went on to rest his arguments on a version of the Vincentian canon, posing a choice for Genevans to follow what the Catholic Church throughout the whole world now for more than 1,500 years approves with general consent or innovations introduced within these 20 years, Calvin adds, by crafty, or as they think themselves, acute men. Well, actually, no, that was Sadoletto. Your choice is between 1,500 years of tradition and these crafty and acute additions, which are not of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church has always and everywhere been directed by the one spirit of Christ and is therefore a body in which no dissension can exist, for all its parts are connected with each other and breathe together. That's Sadoletto. Calvin did not dispute the Catholicity of the faith, but he denied Sadoletto's charge that the reformers intended to lead people away from the forms of belief and worship that the Catholic Church has always observed. As he had done in his Lausanne Disputation in 1536, Calvin made the point that the doctrine of transubstantiation was a novelty, not only repugnant to scripture, but also contrary to the consensus of the ancient church. In other words, contrary both to scripture and the doctrinal or interpretive tradition. Sadoletto's definition of the church as one throughout all ages and directed by the spirit, Calvin countered, omitted reference to the word, which provides the church with clarity and stability. Lacking reference to the word of God and its authority, Sadoletto created a false choice between following the authority of the church and following the inventors of new dogmas as if the reformers had altered ancient faith and practice. 
Contrary to those allegations, the reformers, Calvin says, had not departed from the teachings held by the church uniformly for 1,500 years. They had rather worked to renew the ancient form of the church, which at first deformed and rendered foul by ignorant lesser men was afterwards mangled and almost destroyed by the Roman pontiff and his faction. In direct contrast to the claim that the magister magisterial reformers succumbed to an Anabaptist-like assumption of individualized, spirit-led reading of scripture, and Greg Gregory should listen to this one, Calvin argued a different parallel, namely between the human pope and the Anabaptists, given that both allege the guidance of the spirit in claiming as normative revelation their own pronouncements of doctrine. In somewhat less polemical terms, Calvin's point was that the Reformation served a conservative purpose, did not intend to invent new doctrines, did not depart from the ancient faith of the church, nor did the Reformation deny the capacity of the church to alter its practice and ceremonies to meet the needs of the time. The Reformation sought only to remove practices and ceremonies grounded in superstition and dangerous to piety, what Calvin had explicitly identified as human traditions. And if church discipline and ceremonies instituted by the reformers were not identical to that of the early church, the church discipline and ceremonies of the Roman church were tantamount to an abolition of the early church's order. Calvin turns to Colossians 2.8, refers to the vain philosophy of which the apostle warns as sophistry and scholastic theology. Significantly, this is one of the texts in the New Testament that identifies traditions of men or human traditions as dangerous to the faith. Calvin certainly recognized the necessity of orthodox churchly interpretation and explanation, as is clear from his statements concerning Trinitarian language. Say consubstantial, and you will tear off Arius' mask, but you add nothing to scripture. Say that there is a trinity of persons in the one essence of God, and you will say in one phrase what scripture declares. Calvin's positive view of the tradition of biblical interpretation and theological formulation follows on the medieval understanding that Obermann identified as tradition one, according to which tradition was seen, Obermann's words, as the instrumental vehicle of scripture which brings the contents of Holy Scripture to light in a constant dialogue between the doctors of scripture and the church. Scripture isn't contrasted with tradition, it's together with it and brought forward by it. That's funny, I have a blank sheet in there. Um, the whole issue, Calvin argued, is to remove subjective human opinion from normative status in matters concerning salvation and to insist on the work of the Lord, which is clear and certain and cannot be overthrown either by men or angels. Once the standard is recognized and respected um, for what it genuinely implies, it's utterly false to accuse advocates of reform as lacking respect for any human representatives of the church. Quote, for although we hold that the word of God alone lies beyond the sphere of our judgment and that the fathers and councils are of authority only insofar as they accord with that rule of the word, we still strive to give councils and fathers such rank and honor as is proper for them to hold under Christ. Okay, what does Calvin actually say about tradition exegetically? Well, as Jeffrey Bromley once observed of Thomas Cranmer, Calvin wrote much about traditions, but seldom used the term in the singular, apart from his exegetical works, and definitely not in the sense of tradition as, as, a, as a large body of thought as used, particularly in post-Tridentine Roman Catholic theology or in modern ecumenical discussion. <laughs> the focus of Calvin's theological use of traditio and traditiones was on particular teachings, rules, practices and ceremonies of the church, their sources, the question of their relative authority for faith and life, and the problem of what could, on the basis of scripture, be viewed as legitimate traditions. That datum goes a long way toward explaining why Calvin offered no extended treatment, no locus on traditio. Despite his attention, extended attention, particularly in the institutes, um, to human traditions as a problem, and despite his extended attention to biblical text referencing paradosis. His positive view of tradition and traditions 
may be said to begin with scripture itself, specifically with the practice of carrying forward truths concerning God and God's work in order to deliver them to succeeding generations. The paradoxus noted specifically in the apostolic preaching of the New Testament. Calvin recognized the presence of traditions underlying the written text of scripture. Although he taught a form of verbal inspiration, Calvin did not assume that the natural knowledge and historical knowledge of the biblical writers was entirely bestowed upon them by the Holy Spirit in the process of inspiration. By way of example, in the argument to his commentary on Genesis, Calvin indicated that Moses' knowledge of the creation of the world did not rest on direct divine bestowal of information. Rather, he says, Moses, quote, described what was already known through the ancient perpetual tradition of the patriarchs, unquote. The knowledge that all the evils of the present life and whatsoever is disorderly in the world, that derives from the, fir that derives from the first sin, that is also delivered by the hands of the patriarchs. Similarly, when God spoke to Isaac, I am the God of Abraham, it renewed, Calvin says, the memory of God's promises as they had been transmitted by Abraham to his posterity. The reference in Psalm 105.18 to Joseph's feet being fettered, a detail absent from the narrative of Joseph's imprisonment, leads Calvin to comment on Genesis 39.20 that this information was absent from the genitive narrative, Genesis narrative, but was a matter of tradition. It was delivered, traditum, by the hands of the patriarchs to later generations. Calvin's own uses of traditio are then biblically grounded, resting on positive and negative uses of the terms, the Greek noun paradosis and the corresponding verb paradidomi. Uh, first, the positive. Calvin's positive sense of tradition looks at such texts as 2 Thessalonians 2.15, stand firm and hold the traditions which you have been taught. 1 Corinthians 11.23, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. And 1 Corinthians 15, 3, I delivered to you as, first, as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. In Calvin's view, scripture provides two positive senses of paradoses or tradiciones. First, as deliverances of sound doctrine, and second, as rules of practice and discipline. The first of these senses the term is found in 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions that you have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Calvin comments on the retention or maintenance of the form of the church in its basic instructions, as originally given by Christ to the apostles. He notes the presence of the plural paradoses in 2.15 and argues that in this place it should be rendered as institutiones, as teachings. In this general sense, he says, the term is suitably applied to the ordinances that are appointed by the churches with a view to the promotion of peace and the maintenance of order, a sense that includes what Calvin identified as human traditions without, moreover, any immediate negative connotation. In 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Calvin argues the general term is not used as a reference to church order. The context requires, he says, that be taken here to mean the whole of that doctrine in which they had been instructed. For the issue set forth is most important, that their faith may remain secure in the midst of a dreadful agitation of the church. Paul's call to the Thessalonians to stand firm implies more than the general governance of the church, and he says, does not offer any support to the papists who use the text to justify their invention of traditions. The everlasting consolation and comfort that Paul announces rests on the teachings or doctrines that he delivered to believers. They have ground on which they may stand firm, Calvin says, provided they persevere in sound doctrine, according as they have been instructed by him. The second sense of the term identified by Calvin refers to specific rites, ceremonies, and ordinances of the church as evidenced in 1 Corinthians 11, 12. I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances that I as I delivered them to you. Here Calvin comments, Paul began to issue, consider the issue of decorum in sacred assemblies. The text is important because it can highlight the distinction made between the Pauline meaning of paradosis and the papist claim 
that apostolic teaching was delivered partly in writings and partly in traditions. Um, and Calvin says, partim scriptus, partim traditionibus. The phrasing's important because it already appears in the first edition, I, ch I checked it from PRDL, um, in the first edition of Calvin's commentary on 1 Corinthians, the prefatory letter of which is dated January 24th, um, nine calends, February 1546. This antedates the initial draft, March 22, of the Tridentine Canon on Scripture, which contains the famously debated phrase, partim partim, salvation is contained partly in the sacred scriptures and partly in the unwritten, unwritten traditions which the apostles received from Christ's own lips, etc. Calvin had absolutely no advanced knowledge of the canons, but he's aware of such works as John X, 1526 treatise of the mass with its posing of the partim partim formula against Luther's assumption of a scriptural norm. Negatively, Calvin argued that the papists appealed to Paul's reference to paradosis in order to defend their traditions and many of the superstitious or puerile ceremonies that are not only contrary to God's commands, but are turned into tyrannical laws that torment the conscience. If Paul's text does not support human traditions that place a burden on the conscience, as if accepting them were necessary to one's salvation, Calvin acknowledges it does point toward a kind of, of unwritten apostolic traditions, and he calls them apostolorum traditiones non scriptas. He says that pertain to the order and government of the church. These traditions are not teachings that are necessary to salvation, but are suitable and useful rules or forms of church governance that serve to, ma serve to maintain order in cases where the Lord has prescribed nothing definite. Thus, whereas Paul did teach that all such things be done decently in order, these teachings had nothing to do with trifles of ceremonies, monstrous rites of idolatry, such as are characteristic of the abuses of the church in Calvin's day. The statement that all things should be done decently in order, Calvin argues, is for the regulation of external polity. The advice of the apostle is a general rule for the preservation of decorum and the avoidance of confusion. Stated in this way specifically to indicate that these ordinances are not necessary in themselves and are not intended to bind the conscience. Paradidomy also appears in 1 Corinthians 11:12, where Paul teaches that what he received of the Lord concerning the Lord's Supper, he also delivered to the Corinthian church. But Calvin adds, what Paul delivered to the Corinthian church has no relationship to the corrupt service of the mass. The same phrasing of receiving from Christ and delivering to the church occurs in 15.3, and Calvin renders the verb as tradidi and makes no further comment on delivery or tradition. He thus identifies two positive senses of traditions in the New Testament and arguably in the early church understandings of paradosis, namely the written tradition of biblical teachings concerning things necessary to salvation and, part, and the partly written partly unwritten rules and forms of church governance that could be suited to the needs of decency and order. In the case of teachings necessary to salvation, Paul delivered to the church not what he invented, but what he had received from the Lord. And it's the church's duty to deliver to future generations, Calvin says, not as innovations, but what it has received from the Lord via Paul and the other apostles, followed by the successor generations of the faithful. In the case of transmitted rules of decorum and piety, these do not bind the conscience and they are of temporary import. Tradition negatively understood as human invention. <laughs> Given that the positive sense of tradition or traditions was reserved to teachings and rules of practice that serve to maintain the faith of Christians by transmitting sound doctrine and by duly ordering the life of the church, there is no simple transfer of Paul's positive view of tradition to the establishment of later traditions in the church. Following his positive comment on the meaning of paradosis in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, um, Calvin turned to the problem of the papist use of the text as justification for their own traditions. Their reasoning, he argues, is that since Paul was permitted to establish traditions, they should also be allowed to do so. And if Paul's traditions were to be followed, so should theirs. 
Calvin acknowledged that Paul, as would later Christian writers, delivered rules with the governors of the church. But he counters by first noting that the divinely inspired nature of Paul's precepts, and then adding that it was not Paul's intention to ensnare consciences by promulgating rules. That such a practice would be utterly unlawful, not only for Paul, but for all of the apostles together. The Roman practice of passing off traditions as apostolic, accordingly, is all the more unlawful. Calvin drew directly on Matthew 15, 1 to 9, and its parallel in Mark 7, at verses 8 and 13, you leave the commandment of God and hold fast to the traditions of men, thus making void the word of God through your tradition, which you hand on. He drew a similar argument from Colossians 2, 8. Um, traditions of men, see that no one make a prey of you by philosophy and empty deceit. The phrase, by the way, that you, Paul uses in the Greek is identical to what you find in Mark 7, 8. In his Harmony of the Evangelists, Calvin followed the text of Matthew 15 with some reference to Mark 7 to address directly the issue of disobedience and traditions. When we speak, he says, of human traditions, this question has no reference to political laws, the use and object of which are widely different from enjoining the manner in which we ought to worship God. But as there are various kinds of human traditions, we must make some distinction among them. Some are manifestly wicked, for they inculcate acts of worship which are wickedly and diametrically opposed to the word of God. Others of them mingle profane trifles with the word of God and corrupt its purity. Others which are more plausible and are not chargeable with any remarkable fault are condemned, however, on this ground that they are imagined to be necessary to the worship of God, and thus there is a departure from sincere obedience to God alone, and a snare is laid for the conscience. An instance of an act harmless in itself, as such, Calvin singles out the Pharisaic practice of washing hands, which he says could be an allowable ceremony, if it were not for the claim that God could not be properly worshiped without washings. After all, God's law, he says, enjoins cleanliness and ritual watching. Christ permitted the use of water pots at the marriage ceremony. God permits outward ceremonies as an exercise of piety and allows them to be aspects of service of worship, but they are never to be confused with the word of God. It is therefore, he says, a great abuse when ceremonies introduced by men began to be regarded as a part of divine worship. And again, when in matters that were free and voluntary, uniformity was absolutely enjoined. Outward ceremonies must not be confused with the word of God. A contemporary example, he says, is the, is the Roman practice of sprinkling with blessed water for the purpose of exorcism, a practice that Calvin identifies as absurd. He adds, moreover, that even if the practice were lawful in itself and were not accompanied by so many abuses, we must still always condemn the urgency with which they demand it as if it were indispensable. Christ's response to the Pharisees, why do you also transgress the commandment of God on account of your tradition, divides for Calvin into two parts. The first responds to the person, the second to the substance and point of the issue. Calvin points out that Christ's argument is not an immediate acquittal of the disciples. Rather, it turns the accusation back against the Pharisees, which is in effect Calvin's own turning of the 16th century, back, 16th century accusation back on his Roman opponents. The Pharisees take offense when the disciples fail to observe human commandments, but the Pharisees themselves obey human commandments with precision and at the same time disregard God's laws. It's not as if the Pharisees directly transgressed divine law, rather they did so indirectly in their insistence that holiness be achieved by a human commandment not belonging to the law of God. That leads, Calvin says, to a belief that God's law itself can be disregarded. This depravity, he adds, is greater among the papists of his own time than it was ever among the Jews. He concludes his reading of the passage with a comment on Matthew 15, 9. In vain do they worship me teaching doctrines and commandments of men. Quote, Christ declares them to be mistaken who bring forward in the place of doctrine the commandments of men who seek to obtain from them the rule for worshiping God. Let it therefore be determined that since obedience is valued more by God than sacrifices, all kinds of invented worship are vain. Indeed, as the prophet declares, they are accursed and detestable. Calvin's good at polemic. 
Um, he reads the text then very specifically as a condemnation of the way in which traditionary practices are enjoined as mandatory. Whereas some doctrines or commandments of human invention can be condemned outright as contrary to scripture, others not even in themselves should be rejected because they obscure what God has actually commanded. Calvin did then, despite the comment of one author, did write fairly extensively on traditio or paradosis, certainly his commentaries. In fact, enough to constitute a moderately sized locus after the manner of other commentators of his time. You know, had Calvin died without writing the Institutes, and he had a Robert Mass on the way Vermigli did, we would have a very different Calvin's Institutes, put together of chunks of commentaries, uh, which would include all th this kind of comment. I mean, his, his exegetical remarks embody a positive approach to traditions that carry forward the biblical message of salvation and a negative approach to traditions that fail to respect the biblical message. Tradition in the singular meant for Calvin a particular teaching or rule of govern governing belief or practice. What's absent from the exegesis is an undifferentiated use of the singular nouns, paradoses, or traditio to indicate a full body of extra biblical teaching. Calvin never condemns anything like that. The exegesis yields, therefore, neither a general approbation nor a general condemnation of tradition as such. Rather, it yields a combination of specific traditionary teachings and practices that either contradict scripture or set it aside, and an approbation of traditionary teachings and practices that serve church order or governance or that instruct in sound doctrine, positively transmitting the teachings of scripture, a view largely in accord with what Obermann called tradition one. Um, yeah, I could also comment a little bit about um, the Council of Trent, but let me, let me conclude because I'm, I'm looking at the clock. Um, if tradition is understood by what Obermann called the history of obedient interpretation, Calvin often drew on it, although he didn't typically employ the term tradition, certainly not in that broad generalized sense. He did identify as positive or acceptable traditions various teachings and ordinances that have been handed down and stood in accordance with scripture. He had a broadly positive understanding of the teaching of the church fathers and of the ancient councils, and he viewed them as allies in the struggle against false teachings, including those of Rome. Calvin, like other reformers of his era, also allowed for positive doctrine taught by the safer scholastics, the Saniore Scholastici. His, exege his exegesis of scripture often bears witness to careful consideration of prior interpretations of text. He doesn't often cite other commentators, but if you know what they said, you can find them. Um, the Lutherans were very upset the way he plagiarized Luther, um, um, the, 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 early, the early parts of the Genesis commentary. Um, and he, did, he drew, did draw on Nicholas of Lyra, although he may have only drawn on Nicholas by way of cribbing Nicholas out of Luther. Um, that's hard to prove one way or the other, but it's, it's a real possibility. Um, his understanding of the meaning of the text for the church also often reflected the allegorical, tropological, and anagorical readings characteristic of medieval exegesis, albeit filtered through an insistence on the literal or narrative sense of the text, itself containing the allegory or the trope or the anagoge. As his exegesis of New Testament passages concerning paradosis reveals, he made a clear distinction between tradition as the legitimate delivery of biblical teaching and tradition as imposition of rules and doctrines that couldn't be justified. Even so, contrary to the claims of older writers like Congar and Tavard and recent ones like Gregory, a careful reading of the reformers' writings demonstrates the denial of religiously binding humanas traditiones is not a disavowal of tradition in general. It's not even the denial of the legitimate use of extra biblical traditionary church practices. Gregory is particularly guilty of cherry picking texts, citing them out of context, gluing his results together in a way that assimilates the effects of the magisterial reformation to forms of spiritualistic individualism. But just as the declamations of Calvin and other reformers against vain philosophy are based on the exegesis of Corinthians 2.8 and carefully qualified, not as protesting against all philosophy, so also are their complaints against human traditions, not protests against tradition in general. Um, 
Calvin's polemics were specifically directed at what he saw as a history of comparatively recent disobedient interpretations of scripture, obviously invented practices intended to bind the conscience. To borrow a phrase from Brad Gregory, those human traditions do not provide valid or useful answers to life questions. And as to the positive Pauline reference to paradosis, that is precisely what Calvin identified as the purpose of his sermons, commentaries, treatises, and ecclesiastical ordinances, the handing down of biblical truths concerning God and salvation for the rules of life and worship in the church. No. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Muller, for a fantastic lecture. I know there are lots of questions. I have some of my own, but I can ask them at lunch. So I want to hear from uh, both our uh, visitors present and also those who are with us remotely, if you want to raise a question. Who'd like to begin? Yes, if you'd come to the mic so that it can be picked up on our, our live feed. Yes, I'm Gijsbert van den Brink from uh, Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam. Uh, hi. I didn't recognize you the mask. I can imagine. <laughs> okay, you did, you did recognize me. Okay, wonderful. Thank you for your very um, 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 thought-provoking uh, lecture, um, uh, of which I learned a lot. Um, and uh, my question is uh, whether you think there might be some development in Calvin's ideas about the value of the tradition. And I'm asking this. Um, because early in his career, he had this affair with uh, a guy called uh, Peter Caroli, mm -hmm. who forced him to um, sign the Nicene Creed. And then he initially, Calvin refused to do so because he thought some of the formulations in the Creed, of course, were not biblical formulations. But later on, he got, of course, a more positive uh, affirmation, appreciation of the, of the Creed. So I wonder how that relates to your uh, lecture. Yeah, my, my own sense of, of what, what happens there is that Calvin was, was very reluctant, like other early reformers. And, and, and a good example of this is, is the earliest edition of Melanchthon's Lotzi, where there is no trinity in incarnation. And th there, there's an early Reformation unwillingness to use traditionary terms to state normative doctrine. And I think Calvin genuinely developed in that as he realized that you had to use them uh, insofar as they did reflect a biblical truth. And his own Christianity is very traditionary in terms of its views in incarnation and trinity. So he never meant to deny that, but he did have this difficulty with the terminology, and he did reconcile himself, necessarily so, uh, to the use of it. So there is a development there. And I should also say, I mean, I, I, I probably have an, an odd view of Calvin, or at least in terms of the circle of, of Calvin's scholarship. Um, I once wrote an essay called Demoting Calvin that they didn't like. Um, and uh, I think of Calvin as a person untrained in theology who learned theology by the seat of his pants um, during his career. So the, there are a lot of doctrinal points on which he didn't change his mind at a, at a basic level, but there's an enormous amount of development, elaboration, and learning that goes on, and, and accommodating his own approach to the needs of the church. Other questions, please don't hesitate. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for the lecture. I'm supposed to present a question from online, but it's not there yet. So I have a question of my own. So um, does Calvin admit of any plurality within genuine tradition, both in the sense of plurality of different churches having legitimate interpretation of scripture and plurality of Christians today reading traditions from the scripture? I, I, I think he, he's, he certainly allows for plurality and diversity w within certain limits. So that on, on the one hand, neither Calvin nor Beza have any difficulty assuming that there are 
redeemed Christians in the Roman church. Um, on the other hand, they have difficulty with certain doctrinal formulations. And the, the, same, the same thing goes with, with, with Lutherans. The, the Reformed and Lutherans have enormous chunks of agreement. And then there are these, these points of, 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 differ, of differing. Like, well, not, not with all Lutherans, I mean, Calvin, would not, Calvin and Amsdorf would not disagree on predestination. Um, Calvin and Melanchthon did. And, and you'd have to pick individual places where there's disagreement but beyond those, I mean, certainly there, there's, there's massive agreement on, on passages of scripture and a certain amount of leeway in reading those passages. So you, you go even to different commentaries within a reform tradition and on individual texts, different commentaries will say, will make different points and that's, that's not a problem. Dr. Muller, one of our uh, guests who are viewing this remotely asks a question that's not directly related to your lecture, but uh, the distinction between Calvin and Calvinism, especially on the matter of tulip from oh. the canons of Dort. Well, I, see, I, I don't think there's too much distinction between Calvin and Calvinism on the question of tulip, because tulip is an early 20th century invention. <laughs> um, and. Yeah, nobody ever referred to the canons of Dort as tulip before the either very late 19th century or early 20th century. And it, that's, a, that's rather a caricature of Dort. So that apart from what you might call a, a, a formalization of definition, I don't see a lot of difference between Calvin and Dort. Um, a good example is that when you read Dort's definitions on predestination, they are quite clearly infralapsarian. Calvin is not exactly clear on the issue. Uh, people, some say he's supra, some say he's infra. Um, I don't think you can e easily pin him down. So th there are differences like that um, on, on the question of the, the, the limitation of Christ's satisfaction. Um, I'm not one of those who thinks of Calvin as, as teaching hypothetical universalism. Um, he's, I think he's pretty much in line with Dort. Um, Dort, again, states it succinctly and clearly but no, they're pretty much on the same page. And tulip, just please forget tulip. You know, just, just plant them in your garden, but don't plant, <laughs> don't plant them in Calvin studies. Other people coming to the mic? Thank you. Uh, I have a, a maybe a practical question. Because <laughs> uh, I'm a Calvinist, you know, I'm from a Reformed church, but pathetically, I observed that uh, most connection to to the character of Calvin or to his theology, like it must be polemical. It, it must attack other traditions, you know, because from the phenomena I observe, you know, yeah, this is the truth. How do you mean it must be political? Uh, yeah, I don't know why people like to argue with others and attack other traditions, you know. Oh, I yeah. see. Oh, polemical, yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> you know. It's, it's what, what Philip Melanchthon called the Rabies Telegorum. Um, you know, there, there's just this, this terrible uh, trouble that, that theologians have with one another, but particularly when, when they, they're very much convinced that the other side is distorting the truth and perhaps getting in the way of people's salvation. Um, one, one thing about early modern theologians on this point is I think they're a lot more honest than modern theologians. Modern theologians very seldom say angry things about each other. Um, they, they probably think them all the time. Um, 16th century theologians don't just think them, they put them in print. Um, and they, they do think they're, they're working out the issue of salvation. And, and, and on all sides, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't think you can fault either side on this. It, it, they, are, they are much more overtly polemical they're, and part of that is that they're trained in rhetoric. And, and they, they don't just argue logically in scholastic form, they argue rhetorically in humanistic form. Uh, one of the myths that we have is the scholastics are angry, disputed to people, and humanists are kind and gentle folk. And it's really just the opposite. Um, humanists know how to use rhetoric to get under people's skin. And Calvin was trained as a rhetor. And so were most of the others of his era. So th th that comes out. But th they're trying to defend the truth as they see it, and they're quite verbal about it, yeah. I don't, I don't think it's necessary, but 
It's kind of fun. <laughs> Thanks so much for your lecture, Dr. Muller. So my question is about the key text that you focused on, 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Um, and in particular, the reception history upstream of Calvin. So was Calvin following a tradition of interpretation with respect to this text about tradition? Um, or was his reading more novel? Um, I, I, don't, I don't view it as novel. And what I've looked at, I don't think it is. On the other hand, I, I, just, I haven't made a, a heavy duty study of what was going immediately before him. And you know, that would be a whole other essay, a whole other chapter. Yeah. Um, but it should be done. Um, I, know where to, I know where I'd look, um, but I haven't gone into that in depth. So I, right. that, that's about all I can do with that. Hi, Dr. Miller. Um, thank, thank you so much for, for your lecture. Um, I was curious, given what I'm hearing as a thesis of Calvin's general positive approbation of things in tradition that were useful to, promote, to promoting order in the church. What do you make of, of his or the reformed tradition's rejection of the episcopacy? Um, as, as it seems like that, that rejection is a rejection of something that promoted order in the church for, for a very, very long time. Well, I, I mean, that, that's, that's a significant early modern argument so that the, the branches of the Reformed that look to a presbyterial or consistorial organization of church typically reject episcopacy, episcopacy fairly strongly. But you know, if, if you if there, there there's Saravia who thought it was fine, and then there and then there are what I would call English Reformed. Um, I, I I I tend to I tend to resist using the word Puritan because I I don't really know what it means. <laughs> and um, there, there are Puritan folk in the 1590s who are rabid Presbyterians. But you also have English Reformed writers, and somebody particularly like, like William Perkins, who is an, an, a theological ancestor of so much that comes out as later what is called Puritan. But Perkins has no problems with Episcopacy. The closest you can get to him having a problem with it is that he did attend one meeting at Cambridge where they were talking about Presbyterianism. He never says anything negative. He makes a few positive comments about the prayer book. And then you have the certainly reformed delegates to the Synod of Dort, John Davenant, Bishop of Salisbury. Um, and and you, you, you have a whole series of solidly reformed English writers in the 17th century who are Episcopalian in their polity. So that it's 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 not an exact antagonism, hmm. and it, but it, it does occur in those places um, like Geneva and, and 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 in the Netherlands we have more consistorial models, um, where there is, there is a threat of going in the other direction and being Roman, I guess. But no, that there's being reformed doesn't necessarily mean that you reject episcopacy. Hmm. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again very much for your lecture. Dr. Muller, I have a question um, regarding, I suppose, Calvin's uh, view of councils. And I'm curious if he ascribed or spoke of them any differently when they were ecumenical, um, as opposed to the, the Roman Catholic councils that were more recent um, before his time, um, or if he didn't, or how he, if there's any indication on that. And I, I particularly am, am thinking of the way that um, Reformed Protestants think about the Second Council of Nicaea and icons and whatnot. So, thank no, you. I, as as far as I know, he doesn't have significant broadsides against the early ecumenical councils, um, but he does treat them as, as he does any human theological statement, so that they, they are useful and good insofar as they agree with Scripture. And he does think that, you know, the the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, as amended by the Synod of Toledo is quite fine. Um, the medieval councils, yes, because the medieval councils do such things as ratify transubstantiation. Um, they have enormous, they, they indicate enormous problems with the papacy. Um, and and they, they declare doctrines that Calvin views as false. And so the, those councils, no, he, would, he doesn't view them as ecumenical and he views them as problematic. Um, but then again, you still have him 
acknowledging that there are some saniore scholastici. And my own read of his Trinitarianism is, and he probably wouldn't want anybody to say this of him, but he isn't around to complain, um, he agrees with Fourth Lateran that, that there is one race, you know, one thing, one divine being. And it, it, it's, he's quite in accord with that kind of language. But then again, he would say, well, it wasn't that council that decided if that's what the Bible says. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Dr. Miller. Um, there are several questions online, but for the sake of time, I'm picking the one that's most relevant to your lecture. Um, it's from students, uh, Lutheran theology students at Concordia University of Chicago. And their question is, um, they they're asking how Calvin's approach to assessing received traditions might differ from Luther's or Balancton's, like we read about in the Augsburg Confession. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to, how, 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 what to say about that. I, I think that Calvin's view of traditions and councils isn't particularly different from Luther's. Um, you know, that, that popes and councils can err, and we need to be convinced by scripture and right reason. Um, that Calvin could have said the same thing. Um, but of course, they do come up with different answers. And so that ultimately, Calvin would not want to subscribe to the Augsburg Confession. Um, he, he certainly could have subscribed to the Variata of 1540, and, and the, the Heidelberg reform did. Um, and in fact, I was just, just reading an article that's going to come out in a, in a, in a book um, that Martin Kalber has edited, um, and the author of the article points out that at the, the colloquy of Poissy, the reformed refused to sign off on the Augsburg Confession, and that later on, they come up with their own formula that says that Christ is genuinely offered or exhibited. Well, that's the variata. It's also Melanchthon's apology to the Augsburg Confession. They don't say what it is, but it's fi they're fine with it. So that, th th and, and then of course, the, I guess it's the variata that gets into the 1580 Genevan Harmony of Confessions. And also the Württemberg Confession gets in there. So that the, the Reformed are, are, they are not thoroughly antagonistic to Lutheran confessionality. Um, that they would have a difference on the, on, the, on the doctrine of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. And the variata overcomes that. Thank you. Let's take one more question. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, Calvin's use of church fathers, especially he draws extensively on Augustine and um, in his institutes and in his letter towards um, Pidius and free will and predestination. And um, I was, my question was, um, although he draws heavily in the doctrinal side or the, or the, um, the content on the material side from the fathers, he seems to disagree quite a lot on the forms or on the exegesis or the hermeneutic principles oh, sure. of Origen or Augustine. Yeah. And um, how could you, I, I guess this is more of a pastoral question, but how, to what extent could you agree with the her, disagree with the hermeneutics and the methodology of getting to a doctrine, by, but at the same time adhering to the doctrine itself? And so, you know, th there, I mean, I, I can't I can't give you Calvin's explanation, mm -hmm. but you know, but the fact the fact is he does say that he likes Chrysostom's mm -hmm. hermeneutics, but of course he doesn't like Chrysostom's results. Uh, certainly on, it, on, on, the, on the exegesis of Romans. But he doesn't like Augustine's hermeneutics, but he does like Augustine's results. Yeah, yeah. Now, maybe some of that is that the results, I hate to say this, but the results are not entirely a matter of the hermeneutics. Mm. You know, is, 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 is a, how, how, do, how do Augustine's results actually correspond to his interpretive methods of, of, the, of the epistle? Um, but no, no, this, it's very clear that Calvin, Calvin has his own very clear understanding of the kind of method you should have in interpreting a text. Mm -hmm. and, and that, and, but he does come up with results that coincide with Augustine's using, using, using a different method. I, I don't think that, that perturbed him particularly. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, the other issue here is that 
Calvin and other Reformation era theologians use the church fathers as autoritates, basically the way the medieval scholastics did. You, you, do, your, you do your own cherry picking and you, you take what you, what you can say is yours and you build up a case that, based, in the case of Augustine in particular, that you own Augustine as opposed to the opposition. So that um, Calvin, it, although he may say that Augustine, Augustine is entirely ours, the entirety of Augustine isn't ours. Mm -hmm. there, there's a difference there. Um, but no, I, I don't think you can, you can easily resolve that hermeneutical question at all. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Muller. Let's uh, acknowledge this fine lecture and give him thanks. Thanks so much for attending our first inaugural uh, Reformation Theology Lecture. Uh, hopefully we'll have another one next fall and we'll be letting you know about it in due course. So take care, have a good day. <laughs>